Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You've got what it takes. You are brilliant. You are absolutely amazing. You are created in the image of God. There is so much good stuff in you that you are just about to pop open with goodness. I love to teach on love because learning how to be a lot more aggressive in loving other people has sure brought a lot of joy into my life. And as you know, we even call our TV program Enjoying Everyday Life because I spent a lot of years as a Christian not really enjoying my life. And then I found out that Jesus died, not only so we could go to heaven, but that we could enjoy the journey. And one of the ways that we do that is not the only way, but one of the ways that we do that is by getting ourselves off of our mind and aggressively on purpose, being a blessing to other people everywhere that we go, in small ways, in large ways. And you have the ability to do that. As a believer in Christ, you are a new creature in Christ, and you have a new nature. There is a part of you that wants to love people. There's a part of you that desires to walk in all the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says in Galatians 5 that we have the fruit of the Spirit. It's in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, humility, meekness. All of those things are in you. Even self-control is in you. Imagine that. Everybody say, I've got, it. I've got it. But we also have a flesh. We also have that old nature. And even the Apostle Paul said that when he wanted to do right, something would war against him, almost forcing him to do what was wrong. He said, the thing I want to do, I can't do, and the thing I don't want to do, I always end up doing. So we have to realize that there is a war going on in our flesh. Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. But what we have in us is greater than what we have against us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So we can fight with everything that we think we do wrong and all these temptations we have and fight with sin and feel guilty and condemned all the time, or we can have a whole new focus. We can get up every day and say, today I'm going to live to love. And if you're full of love, full of caring for other people, full of really wanting to serve God with all of your heart then there's not going to be any room for the bad stuff to get in. I just recently wrote a book on making good habits and breaking bad habits. And I didn't call it breaking bad habits, making good habits. I called it making good habits, breaking bad habits. Because if you will focus on doing the right thing, the wrong thing won't be able to find a place to get into your life. So I frankly don't want to fight all the time with selfishness. I don't want to fight all the time with impatience. And I would tend toward being impatient. That's probably one of the greater weaknesses in the choleric or the type A personality is we know what we want. We're firm about it. We've made a decision. We're going after it. And God help you if you get in our way. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd, I've, I've learned to be patient with people. I'm not perfected in it yet, but I sure have come a long way. And so if I, if I purpose to be patient with people, then there's no room for the impatience to operate in me. You've got what it takes. You are brilliant. You are absolutely amazing. You are created in the image of God. There is so much good stuff in you that you are just about to pop open with goodness. You've got what it takes. And if you don't believe that you can do this, then you're never going to do it. You can live to love other people. And you do it for God. You don't do it for you. 
You don't do it for what you get out of it. Yes, you do it to make other people happy, but even that should be a second motive. Our first motive is to do it for God, to say thanks to him for everything that he's done to us. How many of you want to show appreciation to God for everything that he's done for you? You, you want to say, thank you, Jesus. Well, how many ways can you do that? We can say, thank you, Jesus, but there are millions of ways that we can do it if we simply will learn to be led by the Holy Spirit. It's amazing what happens, all the little things that God will show you personally that he may not ever show another human being, but God will show you little things that he wants you to do that may seem little, but they're big to somebody else and they're big to God, simply because you cared enough to listen to what he said and do them. Amen? My sister-in-law told me yesterday that one of the things that God puts on her heart to do, she walks every morning and she lives in a neighborhood where there's a lot of elderly people. And she said, I started while I'm walking, picking up their newspapers and taking them up on the porch. Well, you know, that didn't cost her anything except a few steps. It's amazing what God can use us for if we will just simply be willing to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Every single one of you should be a spy for God. I mean, we all should be spies for God. And what I mean by that is every morning you covertly go out into the world and you've got your God armor on. You know who you are in Christ. You don't go out to impress somebody. You don't go out to have people think well of you. You've set yourself aside. You've deposited yourself with God and you're like, okay, God, I work for you. And can I tell you something? When you're on God's payroll, he'll always take care of you. You tend to God's business and he will always take care of your business. And then you watch and you wait and you listen and you look. And you know, you can even make lists. When you hear people tell you things that they would like to have or things that they need or even things that they want, if you can't do it right now, you can write it down. Pray about it. Ask God to provide what you need. Or let's say you hear of somebody who maybe doesn't have any furniture in their house. Or, or somebody says, you know, all I've got is bedroom furniture. I don't have any living room furniture. I don't have any kitchen furniture yet. Well, maybe you can't afford to go buy them all the furniture they need. But why don't you get aggressive enough to go get a few more Christians together and say, hey, why don't we make this happen for that person? You'll have so much fun. It will be absolutely amazing to you, the fun that you will have in meeting people's needs. Amen. Let's look at John chapter 21, verse 15 through 18. When they had eaten, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son, son of John, do you love me more than all these others do? And of course, Peter answered back and said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. It's a little bit lengthy in the Amplified, and I'm not going to actually read all that because we've got three verses in a row that say pretty much the same thing. And then Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. How many of you see that right on the bottom? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Very last sentence there, feed my lambs. Okay, Jesus, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, feed my lambs. Second time, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Verse 16, says so the same thing. Verse 17, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. It says that Peter began to get a little bit bothered that Jesus was asking him the third time, do you love me? It's almost like, well, you sound like you don't believe me. Yes, I love you. But then it comes back with an instruction, feed my lambs. Now, what in the world does that mean? It's very simple. You know what? If, if I was saying it in today's language, here's what I would say. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, help somebody. <laughs> Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, help somebody. <laughs> Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, help somebody. <laughs> The greatest way that we can show our love and appreciation for what Jesus has done for us in dying for us, taking the penalty for our sins, shedding his blood, taking the keys of hell and death away from Satan, resurrecting from the dead, 
and letting us share in everything that he bought and paid for. We are joint heirs with Christ. The best way that we can say thank you for the life that we have is by helping somebody else. How many of you would, if your children were off in a foreign land, which in some ways, that's kind of the way we are. You know, the earth is really not our home. We're like living in a foreign land and we're God's children. How many of you, if your children were off in a foreign land, you would really appreciate it if somebody else would bless them and help them and, and help meet their needs? Well, God appreciates it when we do that also. Help somebody. One of the simplest things in the world that we can do. Every day of your life, you can have an opportunity to do this. There will not be a day that will go by that you won't have an opportunity to do this. Now, in order to do this, if you're gonna have your mind full of what you can do for other people, guess what? There's no room to have your mind on you all day long. So I guess I could come at it two ways. I could say, get your mind off yourself so you can help other people. And I've said that plenty of times. But I think maybe even a better way to say it is get your mind so full of what you can do for other people that you don't have any time left to think about yourself. The more you're a blessing to other, how many of you have noticed the more idle you are, the more unhappy you get? You sit around all day and do nothing and then the next day you do nothing. I'm telling you what, Monday, Tuesday, by the time Wednesday comes, you're mad. You don't like your life, you're mad at everybody in the house, you're full of self-pity. Why? Just simply because you didn't have anything to do but just sit around and think about you. But if you'd get out and be a blessing to somebody else. Now, of course, the flesh doesn't want any kind of inconvenience. Well, I don't want to do that. You know, the flesh doesn't like to be cold, it doesn't like to be hot. You all love the TV program, but we get complaints about the bright lights. You know. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Let's look at Philippians 2, 4 through 7. I think we want to live with a whole new attitude. Philippians chapter 2. You know, Jesus could not have come here to earth and made the sacrifice that he made for us had he not had and maintained a proper attitude. And you know, in, in Ephesians 4, it says that we need to renew our mind and our attitude every single day. Let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interests, but also each for the interests of others. Let this same attitude and purpose and a humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. What was Jesus' purpose? He came here to set captives free, to open prison doors. He came to help us. So our purpose every day can be to help other people. Let this same attitude and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility, who although being essentially one with God, and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, he did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. But he stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant, a slave, in that he became like men and was born a human being. Now let's just stop there for just a second. Jesus coming here and taking on human flesh the only way I can even begin to make a comparison, and it's probably still a bad one, would be if you or I would decide that for all of the kingdom of little ants crawling around the ground in the world, so they could have a better life, we were going to leave our humanity and become a little ant and crawl around in the dirt with them all of our life so they could have a happy life. I don't think we grasp the magnitude of what God has done for us in sending his own son who was living in glory to come here, what could it have been like for God to have taken on human flesh? It had to be quite challenging. And by the way, just so we remember it, going to the cross was not easy. If we remember Gethsemane, he had to pray so hard to be able to press through the demands that his flesh was making on him that he sweated great drops of blood. That's a lot of pressure, folks. 
So it's not going to hurt us to resist temptation to be selfish once in a while and just go ahead and let the flesh be uncomfortable and do the thing that we believe God is asking us to do. Let me give you one example. Do you know, and I, this is a fairly accurate percentage because I've been teaching for 37 years, and so I've done lots and lots and lots of meetings like this. And about 80% of all Christians are mad at somebody. I mean, I could, I could have changed my message this morning and came, came in here and taught on strife, bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, anger. And I could have asked at the end, how many of you, God's reminded you today that you're angry at someone and you want prayer. There would have been 70 to 80% of the hands that went up. But the Bible tells us plainly that our faith won't work without love. Mark 11, when you pray, <laughs> if you have anything against anyone, if you have anything against anyone, if you have anything against anyone, <laughs> anything, even if you think it's justified, God says, no, 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 no. We justly deserve God's anger, and he's not mad at us today. Come on. I mean, we deserve for God to be mad at us. <laughs> we deserve for him to reject us and put us out of his presence. Certainly not to be good to us, but he's none of that. Why? Because God is love. Love can't find an excuse to stay mad. Something I like to pray every morning and if I can't pray it, then I stop and get my little self straightened out. God, I am not mad at anybody today. There's nothing in my heart against anyone. And if something pops up in there that I've forgotten, then I have to take care of it. If you're mad at somebody, leave it, drop it, let it go so your faith can work. Pray for your enemies. Be a blessing to your enemies. I tell pastors all the time, if you had somebody in your church and you trusted them and you trained them up and you gave them a position in leadership and they ended up going a mile away and starting a church and taking part of your congregation, the best thing that you can do, the most powerful thing you can do is buy them a sound system. <laughs> you say, why would I want to do that? Because... If you bless them, if they're doing something wrong, it is not going to prosper anyway. And if you have a good attitude, whoever they took will come back to you and probably bring some others with them. But if you get bitter and resentful, then you're going to shut down the anointing in your own congregation and more and more people will leave. Same thing works in your private life. You get mad at somebody, first thing to do is pray for them. You say, well, I don't want them to be blessed. I get it. <laughs> I understand that. You can even tell God, I don't really want them to be blessed, but you told me to pray that they would be, so I'm going to pray that they will be. <laughs> Amen. Oh, are you guys getting this? All right. Man, I don't know about you, but I need this today. This is going to make me behave better. 80% of Christians, in some way, shape, or form, are angry at any given time. I mean, you might be angry about something today and get over it, and, you know, then you're okay for a week or two, and then, you know, something else happens. I mean, there, you know, you, you have 40, 50 opportunities every week to get offended, by the way. But they are opportunities that you don't have to take. <laughs> We can say, no, thank you, been there, done that. I don't care to go around that mountain one more time. But we have to have a right attitude. And, and the attitude that helps that is this same humble attitude that Jesus took on, which perhaps says, you know what? I don't do everything right either. I'm sure sometimes I hurt people's feelings and don't even know it. There are times when I have a grouchy, cranky day, and I may really be harsh or rude to somebody, and I sure hope that they'll be gracious and forgive me. 
so then why are we not willing to do that same thing for other people? You can sow seed by living with other people the way that you want them to live with you when you're in the same situation. Let's put some goodwill in the bank and start forgiving people. But it takes an attitude. And really what I want to talk to you about today is an attitude. The attitude of a servant. We don't like that terminology today. When the Bible says servant, it puts behind it slave. And we certainly have a bad idea of slavery because we've seen slavery in a wrong way. But God is talking about not someone who enslaves you, but you willingly making yourself a servant or a slave. The Bible talks about a bond slave. And a bond slave was someone, because there was a lot of slavery in Jesus' day, and when their masters would set them free, a bond slave was someone who said, well, I appreciate my freedom, but now of my own free will, I'm going to serve you just the way that I was when you were making me do it, except now you're not making me do it, I'm doing it because I want to. And see, it, only a free person can be a servant. You cannot be a real servant, because I'm not just talking about doing a lowly job. I'm talking about having the attitude of a servant. I'm talking about believing that you're blessed in serving other people and doing it under the Lord. You know, I gave my little example last night. I said, if I spilled my water and asked somebody to get me some, 50 people would bolt to the door or get me water, and you'd think it was just great. <laughs> you'd even tell people, <laughs> I got to give Joyce some water. She's on TV, and I got to take her some water. <laughs> it's amazing how people, how important people think you are when you're on TV. Well, you know, just about anybody can get on TV today if they can pull it off. <laughs> and there's some stuff on TV that certainly isn't worth watching. But then one of your kids or your husband or your wife at home can say, oh, if you're... Would, would, if you're going to the kitchen, would you bring me some water? You know, what, do you, what do you think I am, a slave around here? <laughs> it's all about attitude. And I'll tell you one thing, you know, I tell a lot of stories about Dave, but I'll, I'll tell you one thing about Dave. Dave is, he is good to me at home. I mean, I'm going to tell you some other stories about Dave too this weekend, but you know. <laughs> I mean, if I start to get up out of my chair to get something, say, what do you want? And he'll go get it. I have a heating pad that I put on my back sometimes just to relax. And he'll, he'll, he'll I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. He'll do it, you know. <laughs> so this has worked so well for so long. Now I just find things for him to do. Honey, would you take the dog out? Could I have some water? Could you get me this? Could I have a clean? Now, I just give him lists. When you get up, could you get my heating pad, get me a Kleenex and something to drink? <laughs> you know, if it's not broke, why fix it? <laughs> Amen? I, I have to be honest with you and tell you that Dave is a lot better at the servant thing than I am. I'm, <laughs> I'm still working on that. If you're gifted in that area and you just naturally love helping people, God bless you. But you know, to be honest, I gotta work at it. I have to do it on purpose. How many of you are gonna have to join me and do it on purpose? All right. You know, Acts 10, 38 is actually one of my favorite scriptures. It says that Jesus went about doing good. You know, that's just so beautifully simple to me that we can just so improve our life and the lives of other people if we will just simply get up every day and say, God, show me who I can be good to today. You know, Jesus said that we should love others as He loves us. The greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself.